Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us in the world. Uh, welcome to our next of our uh, Nano Explorations uh, seminar series. Uh, my name is Brian Anthony. I'm the Associate Director of MIT Nano, and I'm also uh, proudly the advisor to both Yue Li and uh, Mara Alawi, our, our speakers for today. Uh, I'm sitting here in the virtual background of the Immersion Lab as part of MIT Nano. The, I'll call it the, the virtual interface to the data side of MIT Nano. And, and Yue and Marwa today are, are going to share with us their research in sensing presence in virtual reality. Uh, Yue is a, a doctoral candidate in mechanical engineering, and Marwa is a, a undergraduate student, a year-up student in mechanical engineering as well. Um, this talk, as you know, is being recorded, and at the end, I will um, take your questions and your uh, by either virtually raising your hand um, or by um, typing your questions into the chat and I will direct your questions to UA and to Mara in the order that they came in. Uh, and so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to UA and Mara. Um, please uh, take it away and thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Um, so uh, let's begin our uh, talk. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation. Uh, we are Marwa and Yue. Uh, we are currently students in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, today, we're going to talk about sensing presence in virtual reality. Uh, so first, we would like to give a brief introduction of ourselves. Um, so as Yue says, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you for making the time for our talk despite your very busy schedules. Uh, so to begin with, uh, my name is Marwa and I'm originally from a very tiny island in the Middle East called Bahrain. I'm an undergraduate senior in mechanical engineering and have been a Europe with Device Realization Group for the past year working with UA. Uh, as far as my experience with virtual reality goes, uh, in 2018, I interned at a Japanese company called GRI, uh, where I worked on developing a children virtual reality experience for a joint project between GRI and JAXA, which is Japan's equivalent of NASA. And uh, hopefully when things settle down again, uh, I'll also be taking part in a virtual reality experience project with Universal Studios Japan. Um, so aside from mechanical engineering and virtual reality, I am also part of several student groups on campus, um, mainly the MIT Digital Art and Animation Group, where we create a lot of animated shorts and digital art pieces. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yue. I came from Shenzhen, China. I came to the US uh, for my undergraduate study in mechanical engineering department at University of Michigan Ann Arbor. And upon graduation, I came to MIT for my master's degree um, in Sloan Automotive Lab. Uh, at Sloan Automotive Lab, uh, I did computational simulations on internal combustion engines. Uh, currently, I am a PhD student at Device Realization Lab. Uh, my current research focuses on uh, virtual reality, and specifically, I am interested in developing haptic devices for virtual reality and also monitoring the user's uh, physiological response in VR. Uh, when I'm out of lab, I spend a lot of time drawing, and here are some of my uh, artworks that was done uh, recently. Uh, so uh, back to today's topic, uh, we're going to talk about the presence in VR and specifically uh, um, we're curious about uh, what is the presence and how to measure the presence and how to enhance the presence and uh, to give you, uh, to first give you a glimpse of uh, what, um, what we meant, uh, we would like to show you a video of our uh, recent work. Uh, so in this video, we have our research nurse Tatiana playing a virtual reality roller coaster game. And at the same time, we are tracking her physiological and behavioral data. Uh, on the top right, you can see uh, her breathing force on the VR controller. And on the, um, on the bottom right, uh, you can see her variation of the heart rate during the game. Um, so what has happened in the video? 
Uh, Tatiana experienced a roller coaster game through the head mounted display while sitting in the clinical research center. Uh, she was physically in um, uh, she was physically in an office on campus, but she felt she was on a roller coaster. And in addition, when we measured her physiological and behavioral data during the game, it indeed looked like looked like she was experiencing an exciting roller coaster game. So thanks to the virtual reality technology, uh, she felt her presence uh, in the generated roller coaster scene and potentially forgot about the real world. Um, so uh, back to the question, uh, what is the presence? Uh, generally speaking, uh, generally speaking, it is the subjective sensation of being there in a scene depicted through the media. Uh, however, uh, if you dig a little bit uh, into the literature, you can see that different people have uh, different insights in terms of uh, the definition of the presence. And some would say it is the perceptual illusion of non-mediation, which means you are so immersed in the virtual world that you forgot about the device that brought you into the world. Uh, this device are, um, not, um, could not only be the head-mounted display, but it can also be a TV or your computer. And uh, presence can also be defined as the sense of being there, even when physically suited in another, uh, which we usually call the spatial presence. Uh, so for example, if you move around in the three-dimensional world, uh, the, um, the object uh, around you would uh, move accordingly, which is creating a three-dimensional illusion um, of uh, being in another space. And uh, people also later defined uh, another layer of presence, which is called the social presence. Uh, that is when you interact with objects and characters in the virtual world, and they will respond uh, back to you. Um, so uh, why do we want to uh, study the presence? Uh, what is the motivation? Uh, so in terms of the VR research, it helps us understand and enhance the immersion experience. experience. And in terms of the clinical research, um, this, immersive, um, this immersive experience helps us uh, with uh, phobia treatment, such as uh, fear of spider, fear of height, uh, public speech uh, anxiety. And it can also be used uh, for PTSD treatment. And it, and it can also induce physiological change uh, to serve as um, a ground truth for other type of uh, physiological data tracking, um, tracking research. And, um, and these years uh, in the gaming industry, we can also see a growth in sales of presence inducing games and devices. Uh, so we have talked about the definition of the presence. Uh, now you might be wondering uh, how presence is measured. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, there are three types of measurements. Uh, those are subjective measurement, physiological measurement, and behavioral measurements. Uh, subjective measurements uh, are usually done by questionnaires, and uh, these questionnaires uh, are developed throughout the years uh, by researchers, and they ask the user's subjective sensation when being in the virtual world. And throughout the years, uh, multiple questionnaires have been developed and used in uh, used in researches, such as uh, those questionnaires are. Um, uh, those questionnaires that are mostly used uh, are uh, the Whitmer and Singer questionnaire, uh, Slater questionnaire, uh, iGroup presence questionnaire, and there are also a lot of other questionnaires that were developed uh, specifically to uh, experiments and different environments. And the th second type of measurement we are going to talk about is the physiological measurement. Um, so the hypothesis uh, is that uh, when a virtual um, environment seems real uh, to you, uh, it will induce the same physiological response as in the real environment. So we have seen a good example at the beginning of this talk and in the video when we had Tatiana uh, playing the roller coaster game and then we can see uh, the elevation of the heart rate and also the increase of the grip force on the controller. 
um, so in the uh, in the past, uh, people uh, people typically look into uh, the change of heart rate, uh, change of respiratory rate, and change of the um, uh, skin temperature. And lastly, uh, we have uh, behavioral measurements. Uh, the behavioral measurements uh, measures the user's behavioral response when they are in VR. Uh, so, for example, uh, there was a previous study that um, that uh, they exposed the uh, VR user to a pit room, and they observed that uh, when the user walked into the pit room, they would have uh, this uh, avoiding behavior uh, against the drop, and they would also take baby steps towards the plank or even refuse to go into the room. And there is another study associated to uh, driving uh, in virtual reality, and they looked into uh, the different scenarios uh, when uh, the scene was displayed through monoscopic uh, display or stereoscopic display, and the user's response in terms of swinging left uh, to right uh, was uh, different. Uh, so now you might be wondering uh, what is the best measurement, and uh, the answer is uh, very intuitive. Uh, it is to use as many as feasible because it is less likely that any difference in present uh, between two conditions uh, will be missed. Um, so currently, there are some challenges in terms of measuring presence uh, in VR. Uh, this is because uh, presence itself, uh, it has a very subjective nature, and uh, it has also uh, multiple definitions uh, in the literature. And uh, in, terms, uh, in terms of the more objective measurements, such as uh, physiological measurements, uh, sometimes the, chain, uh, the changes could be uh, subtle. And uh, it also requires uh, expensive clinical grade devices in terms of uh, to, to accurately track uh, the physiological data. Uh, so for us, uh, uh, our, uh, our first goal is to uh, develop a cost-effective, uh, objective, and sensitive method for measuring presence in VR. And our second goal is to uh, develop virtual reality contents to effectively create a physiological and behavioral change. So in order to achieve the goal, uh, we, uh, we looked into uh, measuring the grid force in virtual reality. And why is that? Uh, it is because a uh, grid force uh, has a large uh, variation. And we observed uh, that it's uh, uh, it's even uh, larger than the heart rate that we monitored uh, as shown in the video. And uh, the second is that um, the VR controllers are very commonly used with a head mounted display uh, when you play the virtual reality games. Uh, so it's just naturally to think that you can uh, simply incorporate um, a grid force measuring um, device with the controllers. And uh, researchers have also shown that in real life, a grid force can be used to measure uh, stress in aviation, uh, which gives us a hint that we can potentially use it uh, to measure the presence uh, when, uh, when the user is playing a thrilling uh, or exciting a virtual reality game. And, um, and we have also uh, observed a tendency uh, of gripping on the chair uh, during the virtual reality roller coaster game, uh, when uh, when we have uh, player uh, when we have users coming in to try our games, and um, and lastly, uh, this would be a more uh, objective measurement uh, compared to the questionnaires. So as you mentioned, uh, what we're trying to focus on in the study is measuring grip force as a potential physiological indicator of user presence in virtual reality. Uh, now, the tricky part about physiological measurements is that they aren't directly a consequence of user presence, but come as a result of a stimulus within the environment. Uh, so based on the behavioral observation that UA mentioned from the rotor coaster ride, 
as well as previous research, uh, we know that significant changes in grip force uh, can be a result from stress or excitement within the environment. Uh, so we needed to design our environment to include a stimulus that induces positive or negative stress for the user. Um, additionally, to make sure that we are able to get constant feedback on grip force from the user, uh, we included a non-intrusive and natural way um, to incorporate an interactive gripping task within the environment in order to get those physiological measurements. Lastly, we drew our inspirations on our VR environment design from past research like Mihan's experiment, which found that virtual heights um, did contribute to changes in physiological measures such as skin conductivity. Um, another source of inspiration was taken from virtual reality theme park attractions. So in total, uh, we went through four different iterations uh, of our virtual reality environment design, and these were changed based on initial user testing uh, that we conducted. Uh, our experience design can be summed up um, into three main stages. The first one being a training stage uh, prior to the stimulus exposure, uh, where the user would just get more accustomed to using the virtual reality uh, controllers and mainly learning how to grip items in virtual reality. The second stage would be being exposed to the stimulus, and the third one would be completing the gripping task while being exposed to the stimulus in the environment. So our very first design uh, was very similar to Mihan's experiments and included two rooms, a training room for the training stage and a pit room that overlooks a third room separated from it by a virtual height. In essence, the user would first practice on gripping items in the training room and upon completion of the training stage, uh, the door to the pitch room would open and the gripping task for the user would be to carry the items from the training room to the pitch room and throw them off the ledge. Now, the ledge in this case would serve as the stimulus based on the virtual height difference. We initially tested this on two people, uh, one with reported acrophobia and another one without, and they did not subjectively report stress or excitement. It's also important to note that Mihan's experiment also included a physical ledge for users to step onto, which might have contributed as well to the overall changes in physiological measurements. So we decided to test out another concept uh, by increasing the area at which the user can experience the virtual height difference. Uh, we did that by substituting our ledge with a glass flooring and virtual reality. Uh, however, the same users felt that the glass flooring did not subjectively feel different to them from ordinary flooring as to what they perceived in the virtual environment. Uh, we also introduced another concept of pedestals to mark different stations for the grip task item to be taken from or carried to. For example, the first pedestal would hold a teapot uh, for the user to carry to the second pedestal, and upon carrying it to the second pedestal, a door to the stimulus room would open. The user would then carry the item to the last pedestal in the room. Our third iteration uh, basically increased the virtual height um, of the environment and substituted the glass flooring with a narrow plank that still goes across the room, meaning that it still covers more space for the user to experience the virtual height difference. This design had better feedback for the user, uh, but because there was no disconnect or change between the training room environment and the stimulus room environment, the subjects uh, basically reported to us that their subjective excitement was only when they were initially walking on the plank. This led us to our final design iteration where we substituted our stimulus room with a plank overlooking a city environment that is completely different from the training room environment. Uh, so one other thing that I would like to note is that users tend to have different personal preferences um, and so many factors like age, pre-exposure to virtual reality, dominant fields play a role into what a user perceives as stressful or unstressful. And this is was something that we also hope to investigate through the results of our study. Uh, and in terms of measuring the physiological response, uh, we utilize the equivital system and the depth chart. Uh, the equivital system uh, enables us to uh, track the heart rate, respiratory rate, and skin temperatures. And these data are live streamed from the system to uh, the depth chart on the PC uh, during the gameplay. 
And we have also uh, designed and 3D printed a shell uh, for uh, the VR controller. Uh, we embedded the force sensitive resistors between the shell and the controllers to measure the grip force uh, in VR. The result is streamed to, um, to MATLAB through Bluetooth. And uh, with this, uh, we obtained uh, what uh, we showed you at the beginning of this talk. Uh, however, uh, under the current situation, uh, all the human subject studies uh, are postponed at MIT on to further notice. Uh, but when our campus opens again, uh, we welcome you to participate in our study. Yeah. And as a final note, we would like to thank the Clinical Research Center um, at MIT and also MIT Nano Immersion Lab for all of their support and advice throughout this whole process and also for giving us the opportunity to use the space uh, while developing our virtual reality experience. Uh, so the Immersion Lab is also a new facility that is open to MIT uh, personnel. So if you're interested in using the space for virtual reality purposes, uh, you should reach out to them. There are various virtual reality equipments ranging from uh, workstations um, and full body tracking. Yes, uh, and when the campus uh, opens uh, again, and then please uh, come check out the immersion lab. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for coming to our talk, and uh, we welcome uh, the questions. Marwa Yue, thank you very much. I, I, I quietly clap, and I know we can also send along your your virtual claps uh, for the for the audience as well. Um, so please, um, you know, now's an opportunity to. Uh, ask questions, you can type them into the, the chat or, or use the raise hand function. And I will um, try to take them in the order in which they come. Um, I, I did have a question as, as we go here. You know, wh what do you, um, as, as other people maybe have a, other questions, but as you look at the, what's your hypothesis in terms of the, the aspects of a virtual environment that are going to induce the largest uh, physiological response. Um, so, uh, what are the aspects? Yeah, well, I mean, what what things in a virtual environment um, actually induce the most um, observable change in a person's heart rate or respiration rate, or some aspect of of their body? What what are the things that induce the biggest change? Is, do you know? Uh, I think. Um, it depends uh, on the on the person, and then some uh, some people they are um, they are really afraid of the height. So if we expose them to um, to a virtual environment, uh, for example, on top of a building, and that would be an uh, effective way in terms of uh, inducing their uh, physiological response. And some people are uh, are not. Uh, not that afraid of the height, so uh, so there might still be a response, but not that uh, obvious. And uh, it could also be um, be if you expose someone to um, a public uh, speech scenario, and some people are afraid of it, uh, some people are not. Uh, so I I think it depends on uh, different uh, different people. Uh, however. Uh, just um, just generally speaking, uh, so when uh, most people uh, or like uh, some people would uh, uh, would just be a little bit afraid of the height when they're exposed to it. So uh, so we would say like generally speaking, uh, it would be uh, like uh, the height or uh, some. Uh, exciting uh, situation mm -hmm. yeah just to add to what you said it definitely uh depends like on the user personal preferences so um sometimes like some people um have tendencies like towards auditory cues so if you have like more sounds that are added in the virtual environment that would get them more excited or stressed so for example if we would add a creaking sound for the plank that would increase their overall stress in the environment, but others um, have their visual field of view more dominant. So it depends on the person, but uh, virtual height um, has been um, 
mentioned in a couple of studies as something that induces stress for the users. Uh, there are also other things that cause postural sways for the users, such as um, you know, a lot of background movement in a virtual environment and so forth. Very good, thank you. Um, I have a private question that was sent to me, but I see Brendan raised his hand. So Brendan, um, let me take your question first, if you can go ahead and unmute your mic and ask your question. Sure, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, pleased to meet you both. Uh, uh, nice to uh, meet you. Uh, nice to meet you uh, too. A couple, oh, great, wonderful. Uh, a background and uh, a comment, a question, and a few other things. Uh, so my name is Brendan Moore. I'm an MIT Media Laboratory alumnus from 1998. And I was one of the original 150 people in the world developing virtual reality. So Whoa. One of the uh, <laughs> original uh, pioneers in virtual reality in the 1990s era of, uh, of those folks. And I was uh, part of the original Boston virtual reality group uh, that was around from 1992 to around 2001. Um, so I would love to connect with you afterwards. Um, this is all really great stuff. Um, it, re it really is. Uh, and a few questions for you. Um, so the, the first is, uh, are you also uh, delving more into uh, the, the, some of the uh, IO techniques for affective computing? You know, there's the, there's that whole laboratory uh, or group at the Media Lab dealing with affective computing, which might be a great resource to what you're doing. Uh, that was a question. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, uh... Uh, are, you, are you familiar with the affective computing uh, group at the Media Lab? I, uh, personally, I don't think I am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah personally, I'm not. Uh, I, yeah, I'm yeah. A very, I'm, I am very familiar with it, uh, and it's, it's okay. an area that we've reached out to, but uh, UA is uh, not engaged with them just yet. Okay, sure. Um, and uh, the other thing is, are you, uh, are you familiar with the, um, the journal uh, called uh, uh, telepresence and virtual reality uh, teleoperators. That's been around for like 30 years or so. Um, that that's actually a really great resource on you know on on the topic. Uh, yes, uh, we have heard of it. Yeah, thank you for the. Suggestion. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Um. And the other the other uh, thing I wanted to uh, throw out there was uh, in measuring measuring presence. It's my understanding from uh, you know from all the things that we were doing early on that you know uh, what's really really important is that engagement and measuring that engagement you know dynamically in the environment. So while you're you're also uh, being able to measure hard sensors such as you know as you mentioned heart rate et cetera et cetera, um, you know being able to create virtual sensors to measure interaction dynamics within your virtual world will give you a whole new range of, 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 of uh, uh, sensing information. Um, and I was wondering to what extent you've thought about that. Uh, sorry, could you please explain, uh, explain more on the virtual sensors? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, a large part of having a sense of presence is uh, the engagement factor, right? And yeah. since you're in a virtual world, you can synthetically generate your own virtual sensors to measure engagement in your virtual environments. So other than external physical sensors, such as heart rate, as you mentioned, uh, how, to what extent are you considering the design of synthetic sensors to measure interaction in your virtual environments? Not at um, all. <laughs> So those do, sensors do would be. What, do you know what I'm getting at? Uh, those so sensors what? would be like the behavioral data, or. Uh, so yeah, I think so I think I think. Uh, go, go ahead, Brendan. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So to give you an example, and this is completely off the top of my head, but um, it'll give you an idea where I'm going with this. Uh, if you if you have uh, if you have sensors that uh, you know measure. For example, uh, in the scenario you mentioned with the teapot, right? So you measure uh, the amount of uh, engagement that the person has with the teapot, the latency 
um, the, the amount of um, you know duration that they're holding onto the pot, the amount of times that they they uh, interact with an object, the amount of times that they interact with you know with with other objects, other people, et cetera, et cetera. You can design all sorts of synthetic senses, and what what I what I imagine will evolve from that is a set of sensors that are are you know optimized for measuring presence in very specific virtual environments. Uh, you I see, see where I'm going yeah, with that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I got what you mean. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, we have definitely uh, uh, thought about it. So we have um, also considered uh, when we vary, uh, vary um, so for example, the display resolution or the frame rate, and then uh, so uh, in another word, uh, changing the the, the presence, the variable, and how would uh, the user's response, like uh, uh, like uh, what path would they take uh, in terms of walking towards the blank, or uh, how much time they would uh, they would spend uh, in each room, and uh, where the uh, locations uh, that they will be looking at, and those behavioral data, and uh, yeah, we have uh, thought about uh, tracking them in uh, when they were playing the game. Oh, great. Well, I don't yeah. want to hog the conversation, but, um, you know, maybe if you could let me know how I can get in contact with you, that would be thank, great. Thank you. Uh, Brent, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's another, there's another question. Great, Brendan, thank you. Uh, so please, please do connect afterwards. I have another question here that came into a private line here. Um, I think you may have already mentioned this, uh, UA and Mara. The question is, we recognize that, um, there's a difference. What what people respond to is per, is dependent upon the person, but overall, is a visual stimulus more important, or is an auditory stimulus more important, or or are they equally important? Um, yeah. So what's I guess the the yeah what's the what's the relative um, power, if you will, of a visual stimulus in the virtual environment versus an auditory stimulus in the virtual environment to induce a response. Yeah, I think that's something that we're also trying to look more into uh, from the different variations of our uh, virtual reality like environments on what uh, generates like more presence for the user. Uh, so one thing, as you mentioned, was looking at, you know, display resolution, um, the presence of an avatar was something that we've also um, considered and developed. Uh, just you, we're waiting for user testing and also like presence of auditory cues. There's definitely been research uh, showing that uh, the presence of auditory cues does increase overall presence. But as we've mentioned, it also depends on the user. So we wanted to see that for the purposes of our environment, uh, virtual reality environmental design, would it just suffice to stick with the visual cue or would it uh, make a big difference if we introduce the um, auditory, auditory responses as well? Thank you. Um, so please, uh, participants, please feel free to raise your hands. Um, I'm getting some chats here. Um, uh, the question here is, um, let's see. Oh, I mean, what, what is the, um, this might be a question for me or for Megan, but um, how does one use the Immersion Lab? Um, let me just take that one, uh, Yue. Um, oh, yeah. So the Immersion Lab, as, as part of MIT Nano, is a central facility. It's a shared resource for all of campus. Um, Megan Roberts, who is on the call, um, is, is, is the lead on reaching out to the community and getting people in and understanding your needs. Um, but there is a, a cost associated with coming in, um, and that cost uh, has not yet been finalized. It will be finalized over the next couple of weeks, um, and we'll take the most benefit of it when we're re able to reopen. Uh, but some of the resources that are available, as I think we're at the end of your slides, in addition to the, the, the physical lab itself to have motion capture and, and virtual reality headsets, uh, we also will have a significant uh, compute resource, a significant set of software tools, both for uh, creating and building and immersing yourself into virtual and augmented reality environments, but also for doing computation on the sets of data that's irrelevant for such environments, but also the sets of data and tools that are necessary to manipulate the, the metrology data that's coming out of MIT Nano. Um, so there's a whole set of tools uh, that are going to be available, both physical and virtual. Um, and please reach out to Megan Roberts um, and, and or myself, um, and, and we can help you get engaged in, in the facility. Okay, let's see. Any other, I see Brendan, your hand is still raised. I think that was from before. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, Marwa, UA, um, any other uh, comments you wanted to offer before I, I uh, foreshadow what's coming and, and thank the audience again? Um, yes, uh, so just when the campus opens again, and then uh, please, uh, you are very welcome to, uh, to participate in our uh, study, and then you will see flyers around the campus everywhere, probably. Yeah, and uh, please come visit Immersion Lab as well. Uh, yeah, I think that would be all. And then uh, thank you very much, Brendan, for uh, the suggestions and advices. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And then thank you, Brian uh, and Sherry's for hosting the, the, the talk. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And, and just so you know, um, coming up on Thursday um, is our next uh, Nano Explorations talk. Uh, it'll be uh, Kate uh, Reddy. Um, the, the title will be Seeing Super Lattices, Imaging Hidden Moray Pattern Periods at Nano Island 2D Material Interface Using 4D Scanning Transmission Electron Microscopy. Uh, so that'll be on Thursday at 11 a.m., same, same time, same channel, um, and we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, if you have questions or comments or other things that you would like to see as part of the nano uh, community, uh, both metrology, fabrication, data side of nano, uh, do reach out to us with suggestions on, st on students uh, that you would like to hear from or recommend your own students uh, to come and present during our, our pre-lunch hour session. So everybody enjoy your your Tuesday, uh, aka Monday, um, for this week, and and thank you. Thank you.